Hi guys, uh, welcome to Off The Cuff. Um, I'm not here with my partner today, Loic, he's in New Zealand somewhere. Um, but we have a very special guest today. Uh, his name's Pete, he's an uh, ex-member of the Metropolitan Police Force. And um, Pete, if you could just give us an uh, introduction of yourself. Okay, I, um, I retired after completing 30 years service. I finished as the uh, Head of Crime Performance and Strategic Risk. Uh, prior to that, I was the Force Crime Registrar, uh, and I was the final arbiter as to whether or not things were crimes or not, and if they were crimes, what types of crime should they be recorded as. Uh, and prior to that, I was a Senior Investigating Officer and the Head of Operations for the Internal Investigations Command, and before that, a variety of uh, operational roles, uh, twice at, uh, at Tottenham. Okay, so you were on the field as well. So you were in the field, you are in the head office, looking after investigative uh, related work, and then you were also doing, you were on the field, you were on the beat initially, right? Yes, so it seems everybody starts as a PC on the beat. Okay, 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 so great, 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 great. So let, let's just start off with something interesting. Tell me one of the worst things you've seen on the job. Um, probably a uh, young guy stabbed in Seven Sisters Road in Tottenham. Mm. Um, Helicopter ambulance landed um, in a place you'd never think you could put a, a helicopter down. Doctor came out, opened him up with a pair of shears, and massaged his heart, and oh, yeah. he survived. Um, massaged his heart. Actually, his hands. stuck his hand in his chest and oh, massaged God. his heart. So pretty horrific, but nevertheless, it did the trick, and the guy survived. Um, all right, just want to just compose myself here. Okay, so yeah, you know, one of the things. I mean, I've been out of the country for a while. Okay, I mean, I. I, I as, as some of you know, I mean, I've, I was born and raised in London, um, in and around the St. John's Wood area, okay? Mm -hmm. And uh, basically our life was around West London, North London. Within those areas that we grew up in, there were some really dangerous areas, for example, Queen's Park, Mozart Estate, I don't know if you know those mm -hmm. places, right? Yeah. Be aware of those. Um, did you cover those areas? No. Not so much, okay. So these were pretty dangerous areas, but now, you know, after coming back, I've been out of the country for about 12 years. And uh, one of the things I've noticed is these areas have become a little timid these days compared to what they were. People attribute this to gentrification. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with that? I think there is some truth in it, in as much as um, there are some areas, as you say, which historically were problematic, mm. but house prices have increased to such an extent that those people who live there yeah. um, can no longer afford to live there, mm -hmm. and uh, other parts of the community have decided to move in and, as you say, gentrify them. Mm. It changes the whole profile of the area. Mm. Cafe culture takes over in some cases. Um, but it begs the question, where, where did the original residents actually end up? There's been spikes in crime in other areas that didn't have so much crime before. Because I think because they pushed out, you know, your council tenants and so on and so forth into those areas. And there's been a lot of danger in those, those, those spaces. Is that something you've seen as well? Yeah, I'm sure somebody who's got the necessary qualifications and ability could actually map this sort of um, diaspora of, of the original residents mm. moving sort of from central London slowly, slowly out. Uh, but this, this is in itself is not new because you had this with the residents of the East End who, who moved into Essex. Mm. So the, the process itself is not new. Um, it's just changing, as it were. But would you think this is down to Tory tax cuts? Like, without going too deep into politics, because of police cuts, there's been obviously less police in the force. I think you uh, mentioned 21,000 uh, less police officers to be. And also I mentioned that there was, um, uh, you know, police stations being replaced by... Cub some police stations being closed down in tow areas and just being replaced by cubicles, something we have in Japan with one man standing there with a stick. The, the cuts themselves have had an enormous um, effect mm -hmm. uh, in as much as when, you know... Theresa May was Home Secretary. Mm -hmm. um, she made a number of changes which have had a, some might argue, catastrophic effect. Mm -hmm. um, and clearly not the effect it was intended to mm -hmm. have because sure. you cannot lose 21,000 police officers nationally mm -hmm. and expect there not to be an impact. Mm -hmm. um, to fill mm -hmm. the, um, okay. the gaps in frontline policing, people have been moved away from community policing. Mm -hmm. So those officers who saw mm. the bad people on a daily basis and who knew where they lived, who their friends were, who their parents were, and could potentially resolve issues much quicker mm -hmm. are no longer there. 
they, they are backfilling the the twenty four seven response, mm. and therefore that gap remains. But it's it's not only the the loss of operational cops which has had the effect because the, the other fundamental change you made mm. was to um, encourage forces mm. to do an awful lot less stop and search. Well, okay, but if you are thinking about carrying a knife, mm. if you believe you could be stopped and searched mm. and arrested and then convicted and potentially sent to prison because of it, I would say that's a significant disincentive. Yeah, for sure. If, in fact, you don't think there's very much a chance of you being stopped and searched, then, to my mind, people are much more likely to take the chance. Mm. True. Um, and yeah, well, stop and search fell massively. Thankfully, to that, un yeah. under the existing mm. commissioner, mm. things are, are swinging back to a, a much more um, intelligence-led approach. Mm. Uh, and It's coming back now, isn't it? I've just noticed it's starting to come back now because of the, 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 the rising knife crime, right? Yeah. Okay, okay. Before we go on to that, though, just, just in that last point about... Um, you know, we're in, we're in, we're waiting for either Boris Johnson or Jeremy Hunt to uh, to take the helm. But what what would you advise him on this particular topic? <laughs> How uh, would you advise him? I certainly don't think I'm qualified to advise either of them. Just However, theoretically, yeah. Uh, is it in theory? Mm. Um, I would advise them that um, they need to address the cause rather than the effect, because mm. you you'll chase the effect forever in a day, and you'll never really make any headway. Mm. Um, if you were to look at causes, um, where, where do you start? Mm. Um, True. Youth services don't appear to have very much money at all. Mm. Um, in, in, I've yet to see any real provision for youths who are, let's say youths, what, what is a youth? Anywhere between the age of, let's call it 10 and 18. Mm. I, I don't see this very much for for kids of that age to do, mm. you're never going to stop True. kids getting together because that's what kids do. Yeah. If you can channel them into something which is um, you know, useful and interesting and will divert them from the, yeah. the potential of getting involved in something bad, then that's, to my mind, is, is spending to save. Well, how has the nature of crime, in your opinion, changed over the last, I mean, I've been away for 12 years, but let's say the last 10 years, last decade, or more if you want. How has it changed? And I'll give you, uh, you know, a little benchmark. When I left this country, um, I was 24 years old, and up until from about 18 years old to 24 years old, well, 18 was when we were really going out and you know spending time in West End and certain areas. There was a lot of, there's always crime. I mean, I think we saw, I think we saw, and we were involved in fights uh, every week, right? Every week, or we saw, we witnessed, um, and a lot of those fights. It's always a punch up. Sometimes it's the belts. Certain ethnic group like to use belts, but I'm not going to say anything about that. Um, uh, and then, you know, and then sometimes there was some knife crime, but there was a lot of bottling. There was always glassing and bottling. Someone would just run out of the pub with their glass and just smash them in the head. But it was never that bad. And there was never any intent to kill, right? This is just get away as fast as possible uh, or just win this, this group, group against group matchup, right? That's what it mm -hmm. was. Yeah. And, but since I've been away, I do a lot of reading and I see, uh, you know, that now we're uh, the, the number one uh, country in the world, or city, shall I say, acid attack, number of acid attacks per capita, okay? Um, I don't know what the exact stat was, but I definitely know we're the peak of knife crime, okay? Mm -hmm. So those two things there. But then the other thing is that there, there seems to be an intent to kill, right? Because I've noticed that, you know, a, a lot, there was one outside, uh, you know, a family member's house, one of my family member's houses. Very peaceful area, very nice area. And a guy was, he, he refused to give his phone and he was stabbed straight in the chest, in his heart. So it was very clear. I mean, he could have been stabbed in the leg and in the arm, even just to cut across the face, even just showing the blade to take the phone, right? But this guy was stabbed. And a couple of hours later, another guy, a little further down the road, was, um, was he told them to stop making some noise and they, they cut his jugular. So these two cases, they, they, for me, it feels like it, this, is, uh, this is murder, right? They know yeah. what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah. What's your What's your perspective on that? My, my personal opinion is social norms have changed. Yeah. You know, not massively different to yourself. I can't remember growing up at a time when it was ever acceptable to rob somebody of a phone at knife point. Mm. Um, the other side of life is, you know, it, we are a much more acquisitive society these days. If you're walking around with a £1,200 phone in your pocket, mm. I suppose the argument could be made that you shouldn't be surprised if somebody else would like that. Mm. 
I'm not saying it's right, it's anything but right, but people feel as if they can't afford it, so they'll take the easy route and, and, and rob somebody of it instead. Okay. okay, okay. I know what you're saying, Pete, but what makes people go for the kill, though? I mean, back in the day, we wanted to steal stuff as well. I mean, I'm not saying we did steal stuff, but you see someone with something nice and you, something goes up in your head and says, yeah, I, I would love that. And it's what stops you, it's what, keeps, it was what sanity is, right? Yeah. I guess that's the, that's the line between sanity and yeah. insanity. But what has changed now? Because people are ready to murder. Is life that cheap now? What has made their perspective of life so cheap? I think, uh, I think life is regarded as, as cheap. Um, I think that in terms of social media... People can use it to provoke arguments which mm. get out of control and unfortunately they find the only way of resolving it in their view is to actually finish it with violence and that violence can take the form of, of stabbing somebody and can often take Fate. the form as is you of stabbing them fatally. Mm. Uh, and it, it's as if, you know, the, the, the more um, outrageous... Mm you are in doing something, they think the more respect it will get. That's an excellent point. It just brings me to something I read once Do you, uh, about a couple of years ago. There was, a, there was some kind of um, email or text or WhatsApp group. I don't know what it was. It was something going around. It had a point system where if you stab somebody today, you get five yeah. points. Did you yeah. hear about that? Yeah, if, you, if, you, if, you hammer, if you hit someone with a hammer, yeah. you get 10 points and so on. And if you kill someone, you get a thousand points. I don't know what these points are redeemable for, if they were for anything, but, but that was going around. I saw it. It was a couple of times. Yeah. But, but what they've effectively done is mm. they've gamified violence. Mm. Exactly, exactly, exactly. So, you know, yeah. they, they've almost yeah. turned killing somebody into some kind of horrible competition. Yeah, exactly. But, but in, in doing so you almost mm. depersonalize the victim. Mm. You're, it's almost as if you're taking part in some kind of awful and weird mm. arcade game mm. and you're not actually killing somebody, you're scoring points, which mm. how on earth you can rationalize that yeah. beats the hell out of me. Do you think that's what it is? Because that's a topic, um, that's another topic, it's a huge topic, right? I mean, there's been so many articles, videos, and everything done with this about do game and do, do certain games make people more violent, right? For example, do you remember, I think what started off was uh, Grand Theft Auto, was it? When I was, do you remember, do you know Grand Theft Auto? I've heard this is the name, just the name. <laughs> yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. So Grand Theft Auto was you go around and you just kill people willy nilly and you steal cars and you do stuff. Do you think that's desensitized? I mean, it's a big topic, but do you think it's desensitized? Do you think that could be? I don't know. Well, I'm, I'm, I'm certainly not qualified to to uh, to say whether it is or it's not. It, I suppose the argument could be made that, well, actually, you know, the people who put these games into the hands of children, the problem is, what is the, um, the way of ensuring that nobody below the age of 18 can get their hands on it, which impossible. is impossible. Impossible, impossible, yeah. Social media, there's no right. real filter on social media. Anybody can book onto YouTube or mm. whatever and watch whatever videos they want, as far as I'm aware. In your experience in the Met, were people at all using kind of games or digital, or, you know, kind of virtual reality to simulations to... Police officers? Yes. I heard they, they use similar simulations in the military. And uh, that helps. I think there's a place for mm. um, some kind of virtual reality, mm. simulated environments, uh, and I'm sure mm. it, can, it can accelerate training, can improve training, I'm sure. Yeah. But that's entirely different yeah, from actually absolutely. suggesting that, yeah. you know, killing somebody in a game yeah, exactly. can actually be mapped across to killing somebody in yeah, reality. Yeah. And again, it's a, it's a topic I'm not qualified to talk about, so I'm not no, going to go on that one. Yeah, I'm not going let, to... Let's, let's cut that one there. So um, the other thing you touched upon earlier, and I think I wanted to revisit that, was the, the stop and search. I think this is a, a very crucial discussion. Um, I think when I left, I mean, I wasn't getting stopped and searched until I left. I think it was a few times when I was uh, 16 to 18, 19 years old. Um, yeah, it would happen. Random stop and searches, right? I think they, they came to a halt for the last, is it correct? Am I correct? They, they, they stopped doing stop and searches. It didn't stop doing them, but the, the number of stop and searches that were completed was massively reduced. Okay. And what was the reason for that? Uh, my understanding is it was pressure from the Home Office when Theresa May was Home Secretary to suggest that, in fact, um, there were too many stop and searches taking place and they were disproportionately targeting certain sections of the community. Okay. Okay. So... I mean, some people look at it as a, as a racial profiling thing, right? Mm -hmm. What would you be your opinion be on that? I mean, from your perspective, do you, do you agree or disagree with that? That there is uh, a tendency to 
um, stop and search certain ethnic minorities? Um, it's interesting. Uh, racial profiling versus intelligence-led policing, I suppose, what it boils down to, because I think if you asked the general public, whoever the general public might be, who you'd expect the police to stop, the chances are, and I'm willing to be proven wrong, is that they would say, well, if a description was given by the victim, they'd expect the police to stop people who fitted that description. I'm just wondering about the, the sample pool they would use. If you're in Brick Lane, for example, you'd see a lot of uh, subcontinental Asian, South Asians there, mm -hmm. right? You, that's the point. If you were in Hackney, for example, at one point, you might have seen a lot of uh, African uh, uh, ethnicity, mm -hmm. uh, African British people, should I say, um, and then so on. So, depending on the area, the sample would be dependent on that. Um, do you think that plays a part at all? I, I remember I a piece really of work done years and years ago by, I think it was Dr. Marion Fitzgerald, and mm. it was something around, and I'm probably going to horribly mis misquote <laughs> this here, but it was something around. It's not so much about what percentage of Londoners um, are made up of a certain ethnic group. Mm. It was around what was the street population mm. at the time the stop and search was completed. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think there was a, there was a significant difference mm. between the two. Okay. Um, yeah, I mean, if in fact stop and search is done correctly... Mm. Um, and, and people are given their rights. And don't forget, these days, yeah. everything is, is on a um, body-worn video. Yeah. Um, True. It would be interesting to find out... That's your little body camera, isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. And it's, 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 it's sound and, uh, and, and vision. It would be potentially interesting to look at how many complaints are made... Now you have body-worn video mm -hmm. as being, if you like proof of the reality of what went on compared to what happened before okay. officers had body-worn video. I don't know. Yeah. You think there's a kind of tendency for certain crimes from particular ethnicities or certain or genders or ages or something like that any, that you see? It's a big question, actually, I think. It is. It's huge. Yeah. I, think, I think a lot of crime is, is opportunist. Mm. I think whilst you mm. could say, yes, um, in your view, assailants might fit a certain group. Mm. I think the counter argument could be made that actually victims mm. could be seen to fit a certain group. Um, I, right. I think there's a there's also another piece of work done by a couple of American professors, which was all around victimology. Mm. So, effectively, how how would you prevent yourself becoming a victim? Yeah. So, you know, the, the, these two professors, I understand, spoke to an awful lot of victims of crime mm. uh, and worked out what were the the common the, or the things they had in common and which potentially made them vulnerable mm. or attractive mm. to assailants mm. uh, and there were certain things around how they behaved how they mm. walked really? how they looked their eye contact that they made mm. so potentially you know um, their attackers mm. would identify them as being interesting, he or she is worth attacking because they fit my criteria. Interesting, yeah. You know, there's that kind of unspoken, at least when I was younger, there's an unspoken code in London, right? With the things you don't do and you, what, what is socially accepted, right? For example, you don't walk and sit in the train and then uh, and stare at somebody in the face, right? Mm -hmm. So, what are you looking at? Yeah, right? yeah. You're you asking for a fight, you don't do that, right? You can look for a second and look away, right? But depending on the direction you look away or your body or your body language, your behavior. That could lead, not only could it keep, it might keep you away from the fight, but it also might lead to that person yeah. to attack you. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right. Um, all right, let's step away from that. I, want to, well, I think one of the, the, the topics of today is, um, you know, uh, social media. Uh, you know, social media has affected all industries at mm -hmm. almost every level, right? How has it affected crime and, and, and enforcement, criminal, uh, how can I say, police enforcement? Clearly, the Met has a, a, uh, a Twitter feed, mm. uh, as have all forces. The individual boroughs have their own Twitter feeds, mm. and my understanding is, is that they're actually used pretty effectively in terms of getting a message out. Mm. And, and, and I'm sure there's further advances in technology which will make that even more effective. Mm. From the Met side, right? From, from the Met side, yeah. But, but of course, social media can be used by, by bad guys as well. 
so now for the crux of the discussion, um, I really wanted to, you know, hear your advice, uh, you know, for the general public, for kids, for women, for tourists. What can they do to navigate the streets safely in London? Okay, I mean, I, I wish I could say there is one particular thing that people could do, but it's whatever I tell you is not rocket science. Mm. It's this is, you know, around being aware mm. more than anything else. Now sure. I appreciate that. You know, we live in London. And London attracts, thankfully, a huge amount of visitors, tourists. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And, you know, by dint of the fact that they are not familiar with uh, London itself, it makes them additionally vulnerable mm -hmm. because they don't know where they should go, where they shouldn't go, and where they should avoid at all costs. Mm -hmm. That's a joke. But by the same token, <laughs> yeah, Shall there are things. no-go zones. <laughs> there's no such things no-go zones, trust me. Um, I, I actually... For a time, was an advisor to to a, um, to an app mm. um, called Safe in the City. Yes, and I suppose the the very easiest way of describing this is that if Google Maps takes you the fastest route mm. from A to B, this will use historical police crime data. That's where I came in mm. to show you the safest route, mm. and it works well. And if I was to advise anybody, I'd say if you're a visitor to this city, especially. First thing you should do is download the app. Mm, um, yeah. but, but even for people who live there, because crime does change. Generally, there is a lot you can do to actually prevent yourself mm. shining out as a potential victim. Yeah. You know, walk with purpose. Make sure you actually put your belongings away. Don't stand with your £1,200 phone on display. Mm. If you do need to consult your phone, back up to a wall mm. so you've got complete peripheral vision and okay. nobody can actually attack you from behind. Yeah. But again, as I say, this is not rocket science. Mm. You know, if you're carrying a rucksack, make sure it's got a padlock on it. Mm. Uh, or, as some people do these days, I've noticed, seems to be a trend to actually carry the rucksack on the front of you as opposed to the back of you. So you yeah. put the straps over. Um, yeah, mm. as I say, it's not rocket science. Yeah, exactly, it's true. I mean, if... if We've been studying martial arts for a while, right? And I think martial arts teaches you awareness. Like, if I get, if I had, if it was up to me, I would say everyone should study martial arts, but not everyone's going to do that, right? But no. there is, it's all about awareness. So you, yeah, I think you're, you're bang on with that. Yeah. Okay, let's say the flip side though. What do you say to those kids who are out there with knives in their backpack? They feel they need to carry a knife uh, to protect themselves, right? What message would you have for them? Um, okay. The bottom line is that if they carry a knife to protect themselves, and there comes a point in time when they need to take that knife out and attempt to protect themselves, there is a very good chance, a very, very good chance, that they're going to come off worse. And by worse, I mean dead. Mm. Okay? So that's one reason, because the chances are, as valuable as your mobile phone is, it's not actually worth your life, mm. or it's yeah. not worth losing the use of a, a major part of your body or mm. having a, a disfiguring scar. Yeah. Uh, and the other side of life is, even if you don't get it out and you are stopped and searched, mm. you will be arrested and there's, you know, the chances are you'll be convicted and you could go to prison. Yeah. So to my mind, irrespective of the whatever kudos they think they will have with their mates because they can show them, look what I'm carrying in my, my rucksack, mm. actually, it makes no sense at all when you actually take it apart. It's true. Yeah. It's still difficult though, you know, because you've got all these... Just growing up, I mean, depends where you are, right? And what area you is, sometimes you feel the need to carry. I mean, when I was younger, I used to carry a weapon as well, just, just for safety reasons, right? Luckily, I didn't have to end up using them. But uh, sometimes you feel the need to, right? It's, it's difficult for these kids, I think, at the end of the day. You know what? Mm. I, all I would say is that um, imagine your parents, your brothers and your sisters, standing around your grave. Do you think, in hindsight, they would say, yeah, he did the right thing by pulling his knife out or carrying a knife in the first place? No. I actually think they'd say, if only he hadn't put the knife in his bag in the first place. You know what? He could have just either walked away, ran away, or done whatever. Because, believe you me, the grief and trauma that will cause to your friends and family outweighs any, any kudos you think you have with your mates. And if they're the mates who are actually going to be impressed by the fact that you're carrying a knife... Yeah. My, my view would be, they're not your mates at all. Mm. Yeah, true. Okay. All right. What about the police? Do you think the police should be armed? Not to the level of the US, where they put it out for any small thing, right? But uh... No, I was a qualified um, firearms officer. Mm. No. Uh, routinely armed, no, I think. Given the fact that um, 
crime, the nature of crime is changing mm. and there is more of a need to respond to armed incidents and respond quickly, mm. including terrorism, then I think, yes, there should be more armed officers mm. readily available, mm -hmm. but I do not think the vast majority of police should be routinely armed at the minute. Okay. Just to go into that, there are some police officers that are armed, right? Mm -hmm. Diplomat, people that are, police that are looking after uh, diplomats, is mm -hmm. that correct? Yeah. And then anti-terrorist police? You find there are counter-terrorism specialist firearms officers, okay. but there are also um, armed response vehicles who yes. are on the routine patrols, okay. mm -hmm. um, and they are readily available to deploy to armed incidents. Okay, generally you don't see policemen walking down the road with arms anyway. No, so but you... No. No. Unless you actually know what type of vehicle to look for, the chances mm. are you wouldn't recognise the fact that the cops inside the vehicle are armed in any case. Mm. All right. Um, and then, you know, one thing we, you mentioned before, and I think it's good to, to let the viewers know, right? Um, you know, I know you're a man of integrity, and I think that's been proven a number of times. And one of the times was that you, uh, you had to give evidence. Could you, I don't want to finish off the sentence because I don't want to say whistleblowing, but uh, what, can, you, can you shed light on that? Um, yeah, and it wasn't whistleblowing because I actually... I give evidence to a Home Affairs Select Committee mm. in relation to how police crime statistics can yeah. be manipulated to achieve performance targets. Um, okay. But I didn't say anything there that I didn't say when I was a serving officer. Okay. So, so, so what's that? So basically police would not report um, crimes in order to give them a, like a 100% record, right? 100% clean record. Was yeah, it's not 100%, but it's, it, it's effectively, like you know, if you, if you record fewer crimes, then effectively, as the equation works, your detection rate will go up. Okay. Um, but of course, you know, the truth is, you might be recording fewer crimes, but the number of victims actually stays the same, or, or very probably increases. Okay. And if, okay. You, if you don't report them as crimes, then of course you're denying those victims all of the support services that can kick in once the crime has been recorded. Okay. You were a senior ranking officer when you did that. So you might not, you didn't have too many fans then basically, right? Yeah, did you give up anything for that? No, I, I think. When I give evidence to mm. Parliament, I, um, I had retired, I'd just retired. Mm. But as I say, I, I said exactly the same things um, whilst I was a serving cop, so it wouldn't have come as a shock to anybody. Did they give you any kind of counter offer, like if you withdraw these statements or withdraw these claims? Or uh, well, no, I think okay. at the end of the day, it's uh, it, you make a choice. Yeah, you know, you either believe in what you're saying or you don't. I respect that. I appreciate that. That's that's really good. Um, okay, awesome. Yeah, just to finish up. So I think uh, people give the police a lot of stick, um, and you know, senior policeman you are. What would you like to say to them? This is your chance to uh, close uh, off. Okay. Um, <laughs> quite rightly. Uh, the police in London are drawn from the communities they police and they are um, exactly the same people you will stand behind in uh, a queue in a supermarket. Mm. They are no different to you, me or anybody else. They have the same things in their lives going on as, as anybody else. Mm -hmm. um, they're human um, and they make mistakes just the same as anybody else. But the old adage of when something goes horribly wrong, they're the people running towards the problem mm -hmm. rather than away from it remains true. Um, and I did five years uh, with the Internal Investigations Command and my heartfelt, honest belief is that there are very, very, very few people in the Metropolitan Police who I've come across who um, should not be police officers. Mm. Very few indeed. All right. All right. Thanks very much. Just to close up, I mean, how would you, uh, if anyone would like to contact you with any questions, are you available to, to talk to people? No, uh, LinkedIn. LinkedIn. <laughs> okay. So Pete Barron on LinkedIn, right? Yeah. All right. All right. Thanks very much for your time, Pete. Cheers. Take care. Cheers.